Thank you for joining us today again. Um, as you know, in these uh, sessions, we try to give you some updates, but really the time is your time to um, ask questions, exchange information, and so on and so forth. So uh, let's start. Let's start with our proposal team. Kelly, what's your update? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, happy NSF Career Day, otherwise known as the submission deadline for the NSF's Faculty Early Career Development Program. So the proposals team is keeping pretty busy today with those submissions. On that note, I wanted to let you all know that we're working to backfill vacancies on both the proposals and subaward teams that were created by an internal promotion and a transfer to another UC campus. We are doing our best to review and approve proposals and subawards as quickly as we can, but please note that for proposals, you may work with a different analyst during the recruiting period, just as you would if your regular analyst is out of the office. And for subawards, processing timeframes may be a smidgen longer than normal, although we are working really, really, really hard to avoid that. Um, so I just wanted to say we thank you for your patience and your partnership. And hopefully we will have a couple of new staff members to announce within the next month or two. Does anybody have any questions? Well, thank you, Kelly. Uh, that was nice and fast. How about awards team? Good morning from SPO Awards. Well, we have a new person to introduce to you. Anne Parisi is the new um, Team A team lead, and um, she will be serving College of Ag, College of Engineering, and uh, College of Letters and Sciences, among others. So if Anne's on, she can say hi. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you, and I'm glad that I am here with all of you. <laughs> OK, so we are glad to have her on as well. Very, very glad. So let's see. All right, we are um, at the end of July and September is the federal fiscal close. I know it seems like we just got over the state fiscal close, but September is federal fiscal close. So if you have any uh, prior approval requests for federal awards, please send them to SPO soon because August is coming up and we wanna make sure that um, any prior approvals are submitted and any amendments are processed before the end of the federal fiscal year in September. And another is that, um, as you have all seen, the new automated award assignments are, are kicking in and they're working well, but please do tell your PIs that the awards are uploaded at the project level. So if you go to the link in the award email that takes you to the project page, go to the project level, the, um, the award is uploaded. We're not going to have the award as an immediate attachment to the email. That's not possible with the automated system, but it is there for everybody to access via Cayuse. So I hope that um, clarifies things. All right, that's all from awards. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Thank you. Um, Let's see, maybe we should um, go to Alicia. Alicia is a, 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 a director of our research ethics and compliance in Office of Research. Uh, she has some updates on DOD um, and issues of uh, foreign influ influence, as well as I believe RCI, I mean RCR and other um, topics. Alicia could take it. Yeah, just do I have um, access to share slides we don't see your your yes. um, uh, camera is off okay just one second let me pull it up if you want we can go to james and come back yeah to why don't you go to james and then okay, come back to me james thanks. um any updates from accounting? Yes, good morning. Um, uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I do have something. I want to share my screen as well. Perry, I'm good to share. Yeah, you should be. Okay. 
Um, as we have, uh, you know, CGA, as of yesterday, we finally uh, got through our phase of physical close. So now we are, um, you know, focusing in on, I guess, this end game over the next few months of wrapping up our, our KFS lives and getting ready to transition over to uh, Aggie Enterprise or the Oracle Financial System. So I'm going to share something that um, is, is the result of that. But um, congratulations, everyone, that, <laughs> that made it through what should be the last fiscal close cycle in KFS in Kuali. Uh, it'll be a whole new world next time around. Um, okay, I'm going to share and... Um, I, I'm hoping that you all will find this welcome uh, news. Uh, as, as part of, I, I want to talk about a change in the way we're going to be recording um, IRRs on the books for, for everyone um, to, to see. Um, um, this is actually, actually maybe my next slide would be better. Uh, so uh, just real quick, IRRs, um, as, uh, IRRs are basically the invoices that campuses send back and forth to each other to get reimbursed for multi-campus agreements. And multi-campus agreements are what um, we put in place to uh, allow us to transfer stuff back and forth between the campuses. Um, looks like an invoice, very much like an invoice. Um, this is one that we got from Berkeley, you know, well, not that long ago, a few days ago. Um, and it, um, one thing that, that you may or may not be aware of is the MCAs do not require any detail. We just tell, the campuses just tell each other, send us this chunk of money. This is what we, this is what we spent. This is what we need to be reimbursed. Um, there's no detail about salary, supplies, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the rub is, um, the way we have done it in the past for the last, well, I don't know, since the beginning of time, maybe, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a little bit um, confusing. So I, I put some things here. I actually just want to click up. So what, what we do is we put a, but as you know, we put a budget on your expense account for the full MCA, but then when the other campus bills us and we pay them, we're pulling budget out of your expense account, moving into the unexpended balance account putting the financial activity in the unexpended balance account. You all don't like to look at the unexpended balance accounts, right? Am I right? Thumbs up, thumbs up or thumbs down. I see at least a hands up, right? It's like, that's not my account. Why do I need to look at it? I don't care. Well, but the, <laughs> so um, it's confused. Bottom line here is it, it's a little confusing. And then for just a picture of it, right? Here's what here, here's in pictures of what I just said really fast is here's the old way we did it. We would throw a budget in the multi-campus, but there's no, oops, I will turn my little highlighter thing on. So this is when we would set it up. There's your budget. There's no expense here. And then as we go along, oh, payment has gone out. I don't know if the circles are the right way, but $5,000, $6,000 of your budget just went up into the UB account, the expense associated with it is up in the UB account. If you're looking at your expenditure account, well, huh, looks like nothing's there, right? So that's why, um, it, it, especially for newer folks or, or whatever, it can be confusing to remember, hey, I've got to fold in what's in this other UB account to understand the overall activity. All right, so uh, again, it looks like there's no expense in here. Um, is this confusing? Yes, I think so. That's, um, I get confused. Um, but um, hang on a sec. Uh, I hope that this is going to be good news. So um, common chart of accounts is part of the Aggie Enterprise, you know, overall initiative. This is um, a requirement of UCOP that we start reporting to them in the new um, chart structure, and many of you probably have been involved in mapping your current accounts over into the new and, 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 and getting that all ready to go. Um, but one thing that is, and we're mapping as of now, the requirement starts, you know, yesterday. <laughs> anyway, for, the, for our July reporting, we have to be going into the new um, framework. So we're doing behind the scenes stuff, taking your KFS information, 
when I say we, I shouldn't say we, because <laughs> that's not me. Uh, it's other folks in finance and, and in IT that are getting it to go to the right place for, for UCOP. Um, but what that has done is it has, um, oops, um, uh, it now allows us for, for posting um, the multi-campus IRR activity directly into your expenditure account. And I don't know if allows is the right word or maybe it's um, required. So this is something we have to do for the next few months. Um, but I think it's going to be nice to see because um, what you're now going to see is this is from a test system. So there's no um, appropriation here. <laughs> Oops, wait, go back. Uh, but what you're going to see is that expense sitting right there in your expense account. The budget would still be there. Again, pretend, pretend like there's budget. I, I, this, I didn't have a, a live example to show you yet. Um, but anyway, that's what I wanted to share. Hopefully uh, this will be you know, helpful for uh, a few months of actually seeing those things post. Um, you'll also be able to tell if you have, you know, oftentimes there's more than one campus, participating campus involved, and you'll be able to, oh, my example here didn't have a multi-lines. Well, you'll be able to, if you run a, an FIS2, you'll be able to see which particular campus uh, the payment went to just right there in your account. Um, if you had um, multiple campuses, you would have multiple lines. We have a separate object code for each campus. So MC07 represents Santa Cruz. Um, you know, one is Berkeley, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. I deliberately talked fast at the beginning and then I kind of forgot to slow down a little bit because I was trying to um, add to the excitement and the confusion of the old process. Um, let's see. Yes, this is something that we, you all, I, I'll say you all, many folks have wanted this for a long time and we have actually tried in the past, you know, um, a, uh, in the 20 years that I've been here, we've made a couple of attempts that just didn't work because of the, really the administrative, it was just gonna cause more of a mess than it was going to be worth. Um, this actually is a better process, I think from your point of view, because you can see it right where it is. It's going to be, I, um, I don't know if any of my folks are on, but I think from the CGA, perspective. It's also simplifying things. You know, we don't have to do that budget thing anymore. So it, it kind of uh, just streamlines it. Um, I think I've got a slide just on the other side of the equation. I forgot if it threw it in here. Oh, uh, on the other side of the equation where we are receiving funds from that other, from another campus, um, the process changes here as well. I don't think it's going to make that much difference to you all, um, but historically we would re be recording the credits into the unexpended balance account um, going forward for the next few months. We will be recording it into an income account, so it'll appear as multi-campus income. We have another set of object codes that we set up to manage those transactions. Um, but again, when when we are receiving the funds, I think for you all, you're fine. You, you've always been okay when you're just looking at your expense account. There, there's no change uh, from that for that perspective. Um, okay, where are the, these changes? These, um, I believe. Um, what I'm talking about is just the MCA IRR process. The IOC, I think they actually did also set up some um, of things on that side, but but that's a, that that is um, the accounting and financial reporting group. I don't know if anybody from that team might be on and can speak to that. Um, okay.
Michael, I'm reading your question. Will logs of invoices be tracked by CGA, the department, or both? I'm Wait, well, I'm not sure I quite an oh you... James, thank you. Yeah, I just know that CGA at one time used to track all the invoices received for each MCA. Um, just a very simple tracking log. And I believe departments are encouraged to do the same thing just so nothing's missed. But I was just wondering, it's been a while since I've been involved in such a process. If you know, if one department such as CGA is doing it, can the department simply reach out to CGA or should the department keep their own logs just to be on the safe side? I, I, um, I'll be honest, I don't know what what we're currently, if we have a specific tracking log. Um, Nikki, by chance, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Can, can you can you share your that part of the process with what we're currently doing? It seems like we sunsetted all of that tracking because it was on the ledger, but you know. We did. We no longer track them separately per okay. MCA, but when I process the IRRs, a copy is kept up in our server so that we have copies of every single IRR that we are paying. Right. Okay. So there's your answer, Michael, is if you want a log, a tracking log, that would be <laughs> fine <laughs> if you want to put it together on your side, but um, we aren't going to have it for you. Again, it's pretty, you know, it's in the ledger. Okay, thank you. There's not going to be a budget by, if there's multiple MCAs, for example, there's not going to be a budget for each MCA. No, no, we, 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 we thought about that, but, and again, this is, um, this is this transition period. Uh, we didn't want to complicate it. And, you know, we, when the, 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 the prop, one reason that we decided that's not the best approach is when we set up, set things up, we don't always know where the funding should be coming from, you know, so it, it, it's, it's just in the budget as a big blob and then as the multi-campus agreements come in then we perpetually be moving budget back and forth um yeah thank you this is still a huge improvement okay good i was hope i was hoping that folks felt like this was going to help now now okay the, the point the 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 last thing i need to make sure everybody is is in sync with is this is for going forward for July through, you know, December. Um, we are not, so everything that's already been recorded up through June of 23 is going to stay where it is. So everything that's in the UB account already is going to stay in the UB account. We're going to, <clears throat> we'll have to do a, um, so that, um, if I go backwards, maybe I can. Oh yeah, the pretend budget that's not there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, um, so what we're going to do is, let's say you had a, I don't know, a five hundred thousand um, dollar multi-campus agreement with San Francisco, and and they have already been reimbursed for three hundred thousand dollars of that, and the UB account. Um, Um, am I doing it backwards? See, this is where I get, everybody gets confused. Um, yeah, so in, in the UB account, you're, you're just going to have that 300 sitting up there down in your expense account here. You would have that remaining $200,000 left in SBMC that hadn't been reimbursed but that's, that's just going to stay the, where it is. And then going forward over the next few months as San Francisco asks for reimbursement, you'll see those amounts incrementing into your expense account. But that 300K that was recorded up through June is just gonna stay where it is. So you're going to, if you wanna see the overall picture of the, of the status of your project, you're still going to have to reflect back and understand that we, we set that 300K out um, and it's sitting on the UB account. I should, I, sorry, I didn't have a picture to, to do that with the budget here and, and the old UB accounts, but anyway, hopefully that made some sense. Yeah, 
Um, okay, that's really the big thing that I wanted to share. I, I thank you for uh, joining us this morning. Um, I will, I don't see any more questions coming in. So I will hand it back to Ahmad. Thank you very much, James. Okay, Alicia, seems like you are set to go forward. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to come speak. My name is Alicia Hellman, for those of you who I have not met. And I am the Director of Research Ethics and Compliance. And I'm going to share just some updates that are going on right now. Um, let's see. Pull up my PowerPoint. All right. Play. Okay. Is everybody seeing my screen? Yes. Excellent. All right. So I'm just going to share with you. I'm calling it, I'm calling it just some hot topics because we're in the summer and some of the topics involve summer. All right. So the, um, oh, did I go? Yep. So here's some, to the topics I wanted to cover today that we got kind of a wide range of different issues, lots of stuff popping up. So the first one's going to be about um, responsible conduct of research has some updates. NSF has made some changes, and so we've updated our program. I want to get into a little more detail about that. Also, I just want to provide you guys share some um, summer research travel tips, um, and this kind of relates in you know expert control areas where there could be some clients compliance area risks when which involve travel for our researchers. Then the third one is DoD has a new policy on countering unwanted foreign influence in fundamental research, and I'm going to uh, get you guys a little update about what that's about. So the first one is um, some new RCR updates. So NSF has made some changes. Some of the changes involve um, who is now required to take the RCR training um, and some changes to what is now being required. And also, we've made some updates to our program. Some of these are to address the concerns, and some of it are just as uh, improvements on the program. So um, what is required? So NSF now is requiring that it isn't just, you just be specific researcher, you know, um, like postdocs and uh, graduate student researchers and undergraduates take this RCR training. So now it is everybody. It's all faculty, senior personnel, et cetera. And this is going to be for um, new NSF grant proposals that are submitted on our after July 31st. So those that get awarded are going to have to follow these new requirements. And um, so these new requirements also include training requirements on mentorship. And they're also requiring uh, research security training, export control training, disclosure training, and reporting requirement training. So they're really focusing on not just, you know, who's doing it, but actually the topics. They really want to make sure that all the researchers are really you know, as it's called, and actually they've even renamed it, they're now calling it responsible and ethical conduct of research. They're really looking to make sure that everybody is uh, really, you know, learning these things, doing these things. And um, as you can see, it's kind of a hot topic. And when we get to DOD, you'll see that these are things that the federal agencies are really looking at. So in order to address these new NSF changes, we've made updates to the program. So, you know, a lot of our, the, our uh, responsible conduct research requirements come through city um, and, and also we do online training. So these city classes have been updated and so now anybody taking the city training, not just NSF, but um, everybody will include these new topics to make sure that all of our faculty are getting, you know, awareness and learning on, on all of these important uh, compliance topics. Um, and so also we've updated our Zoom series for those and um, anybody is free to actually attend these if there is a hot topic that somebody would really like to learn more about it is it um, they can feel free to check it out. So we're doing some new things such as, um, you know, like ethical use of AI in research. So we're really trying to supplement these uh, topics that they have to take in these city online modules with some really interesting you know, faculty speakers. Um, I think we're gonna have one in November actually from uh, a Duke faculty who's going to talk about uh, concerns about using your own texts, what's called like self-plagiarism and some um, things. So it's you know really trying to make these things interesting for, for everybody and kind of really supplement the learning. 
All right. So if there's questions um, about RCR, please direct them to Elizabeth Chase, who is the um, RCR coordinator. All right. So now I'm going to talk about some of those research travel tips for the summer. So, you know, some of the faculty, you know, as they're traveling, anything they're kind of taking with them could be considered an export. And so, you know, I just want to make sure everybody's aware that and make sure that everybody knows that we're here, the RICO office is here to help and kind of let you know what we can do to help for those, um, advise on those travel situations. Um, so I kind of, to try to make it a kind of quick, easy, I did a little like who, what, where, why, to try to explain like where, how the thinking about some of these compliance areas. So the who, so one of the, this is where we're thinking about who is this researcher working with? Um, and this is where the government has, you know, lists of entities and um, people who are on government lists where there are concerns. So some of them can be a university where there's a risk, or it could be a person who they consider a risky person to work with. Potentially they, um, you know, don't want information being shared with, you know, certain entities. So that's where our office comes in and we will screen to make sure that these participants who we're engaging with abroad, that we are allowed to do that research with them. All right, so the what? So the government, as you know, regulates, you know, for economic purposes, for political purposes, and for security purposes, they regulate what technology that we have that we share with other nations. And so one of those, you know, and so part of that reason is why they have these export regulations. So that's why if a researcher is bringing something that could be considered where there might be a military application, then they would say, hey, you know, we, you know, you might need a license in order to ship that. So some of those could be, you know, like a biological toxin that could be used um, as a weapon of war or, you know, special technology that we want to ensure that we're developing, but potentially we don't want countries um, that we have malign influences with that where they're you know, we would want to share some of that stuff with them. So that's kind of where, just kind of checking to see what that faculty has that they're bringing with them to make sure that it's something that they're allowed to bring and it wouldn't require a license. So that's where my office can find, determine if an license is actually required. We'll look up that export control classification and say like, hey, bringing this item to this country, you're good to go. That's always our hope. So the where is, as I mentioned, you know, there's certain countries where they don't want certain things going to, um, and so there's a lot of lists and actually, technically there's people on almost every country on those lists, but then there's actually specific country embargoes where specific items are not allowed to go to specific countries. And they really have a lot of comprehensively sanctioned where really they don't want anything going to most, to specifically to like Iran, uh, North, obviously North Korea, Cuba, Russia, uh, and Belarus. So some of those. There's some things I can have some of them, like mostly it's going to be nothing to go. And so, you know, obviously if you saw somebody was like, oh, they're going to Venezuela or, you know, Cuba, you know, kind of reach out and let me know. So there are trips that um, are allowed that do go to Cuba. So there are things that are, you know, there can be exceptions. So don't, you know, just, just reach out and I'm happy to kind of help guide you around what those, you know, random sanctions and embargoes of the, you know, it's kind of one of those very, it's a very nuanced thing because it is so specific to certain countries, certain people, certain topics. So that's why my office is here to kind of help. Alicia, I have a question. Yeah. Somebody yeah. has asked, you know, the recent, I mean, the list you are showing on the screen right now, the countries that they are there. Uh, if I remember it correctly, Crimea uh, portion of Ukraine was on the list too before. Is it yes. still on the list or not? Yes. And it's expanded. So now it's not just the, in Ukraine, it's not just Crimea. It's like that Donetsk region and um, another one of those regions, basically the regions that are at war right now. So it's and all there. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, how did I get there? Uh oh. Sorry, wrong slide. Hopefully that didn't uh, get missed. Um, no, that's just an old one. Okay. So the why. So I think I kind of mentioned this before about how there's concerns about national security trade protection. And so this is kind of just kind of that I know for me, I always like to know, okay, so why do I need to follow this? Why am I looking at these regulations? 
And so one of, and it's just kind of let you know that the government does have economic concerns, you know, like we want to make sure that our businesses are not losing money to competitors abroad. You know, there could be national security concerns, you know, that idea. So those, those are kind of what the government thinks about when they create these regulations. And so because of that, that's why they have certain licensing requirements. And so that, you know, and, and, you know, I know a lot of times it's frustrating that there's a lot of different uh, bureaucracy and compliance things, but do you know that, you know, my office is here to, you know, help researchers, help anybody doing their research. You know, we want to protect you. We want to protect the research, protect the university. And so that's kind of why, you know, I, I bring up the reasoning is, is that, you know, the government does have a reason and it's not just, we're, we're not trying to add to your bureaucracy. We literally just want to make sure that you can do your research and proceed without any problems. All right. So another thing to just kind of as a heads up is, you know, thinking about is when you're bringing a laptop, certain countries, certain encryption software may not be allowed. A dual may not be allowed. And, you know, that can be specific by country. So if you have questions or if you know somebody is traveling in a country where potentially they may not be able to use that stuff, um, feel free to refer them to my office. I'm happy to kind of explain to them what they're allowed to do and uh, for those uses and what they can bring with them. All right, so the next topic I just want to talk about is, so DOD has a new policy and it's um, on countering unwanted foreign influence in fundamental research. So for this new policy, what the, um, starting, it's going to be starting in a year. So on August 9th, 2024, they are prohibiting um, individuals in funded awards from having participated in what they call malign foreign government sponsored talent recruitment programs or you know, if you're uh, failing to have a policy addressing the programs. Um, so according to this memo. So one of the things that they're doing, so they're looking at, they want to make sure that all fundamental research is secure, that anybody participating is fully disclosing that their relationships so that they can look at these relationships and make sure that they're not engaging with somebody who potentially is not, you know, somebody that they have a, a risk where, you know, because it is, it's DOD, Department of Defense money, they're, you know, maybe the topics that, that they don't necessarily want us sharing that information. Maybe they're concerned about a relationship that somebody has. And, and because of that relationship, they might be forced, you know, to disclose certain information about the project they're working on. And so they've come up with these things that they would, they're trying to do to kind of mitigate that risk. Um, and they're also kind of one of, share and let people know, okay, this is, relationships are what's allowed. And also these are where we're seeing relationships of concern. So they came up with a new uh, strategy to, that they're planning to use that they're gonna to mitigate these risks um, for people who are on these awards who could be disclosing things. Um, and so some of these things are, they're gonna do some risk awareness training. They want to may be increasing reporting so like at that RPR, RPBR stage where they're asking people to maybe update their disclosures, they want them to, they're going to look at people's relationships. They may come back to them and say, hey, you know, show us the contracts you have with these foreign individuals. And also maybe coming back to ask questions about what is your relationship? Sometimes it could be because, you know, somebody you've worked with on a, you're working with on a different grant. It could be somebody you're consulting with. It could be. Um, you know, any, uh, maybe if you have students who are working in your lab from, you know, from a foreign, another foreign institution through an agreement, these are things that they're going to be looking at. And, you know, obviously in worst case scenario, if there's something, a relationship that they found was very extreme, they may ask, um, they may, be, you know, require somebody to resign from that, but that would be like the extreme. So they created a, a risk matrix where they're asking, like, they're looking at the factors and then they're saying, okay, well, we want, you know, mitigation me measures are either going to be recommended, it could be required. And so, and you know, those are, would be those measures I kind of mentioned about reviewing people, maybe even requiring somebody to step down. And so some of the, the factors that they're kind of looking at are going to be those, is anybody engaged in a foreign talent program? And so that would be, you know, are they getting an award from a foreign country where, 
um, you know, maybe they've got an award and they're doing some research abroad and there's a concern that that relationship could influence. Sometimes it's by requirement in that contract agreement where they've accepted this money for this program that they have to like share information with them. Um, sometimes it can be funding sources of concerns. You know, is this from a government funding source or is it from an entity list funding source? Um, they're going to look at patents. They're going to see, you know, are you working with a lot of people from, you know, a specific country where we have concerns about our the relationship? Uh, and also, again, that entity list. And that's the thing that I think I mentioned to you before when I was talking about those, who you can work with. So there's there are universities that are on entity lists. There's going to probably be new ones that are going to be added. I think based on this, they did include a university, um, DOD, on this list that they provided, which is not yet on the entity list. but um, I think we expect that it, it may end up on there. So these are the kind of things that they're going to be looking at that um, faculty receiving these awards are going to potentially have, you know, a bigger increase in disclosure requirements and what they're going to be expected to be sharing. And then there's the possibility that the DOD is going to be coming back. So we will, obviously, this is new. It won't be implemented for another year. So I expect that there will be more guidance and uh, changes and things. It's just kind of a, just want to give you guys like a heads up to, to kind of, you know, let you guys know what's coming. And so you can, it's also a good like forecast so you can see what's going on in the federal agencies and their requirements of um, what they're looking at with things um, in that direction. All right. So if there's any questions, please email um, OR underscore exports. And um, I'm happy to take any questions about anything I've talked about, if anybody has any. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, as we are waiting to see if other questions come in, I had a couple of uh, side questions that came to me directly. Uh, first, I know that you know the name of your unit has changed. It's you now I am being asked what's RICO. Yeah, so that's the Research Ethics and Compliance Office. Okay. So yes, yeah, so we used to be um, it used to be RCI. It is now RICO, and part of that is because it's a whole brand new team. Um, kind of a change in some of the areas that it's covering, and uh, so it's a it's a new rebranding, and hopefully you'll see some uh, new things, new people. Um, I'm a new person, so we're very excited and um, always here to help. So, thank you very much, Alicia. I have one more question. Um, this is um, I know that we don't have directions from OP yet. This this has to do with NIH's requirement related to foreign recipients of, I mean, sub-recipients and you know, getting their data, notebooks, and so on and so forth. Any updates on that? And I know it's going to become effective in October. Um, yeah, um, I haven't heard anything. I, I think we're gonna hear something from OP soon. Um, I know, I think Koger and a lot of the agent people are writing, you know, contacting um, about, this so I I, I kind of want to you know I don't want to say anything until I kind of get that guidance from OP and see what they say but um yeah we'll see what happens okay thank you any other questions for Alicia I don't see anything more all right well then I will stop sharing and um thank you everybody and again if anybody has a question that they think of later please feel free to reach out. Okay, this is uh, open up time for questions regarding anything whatsoever that you know any of our offices works on. Doesn't have to be related to what was discussed today. Any questions from anybody? Any sharing of information or anything you want to talk about? Uh, Bill, talk. You seems like you you want to say something. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, Ahmad. Good morning. I'm, I'm actually not sure who this question is for. I think it may be for James. I was in a training, a grad studies training last week where um, we learned about a new title code for what are called trainee fellows. And this question has to do with a specific situation, but I think it's more generally applicable. So it's my understanding that um, what used to be trainees are being retitled, they're getting a new job code. And it seems like from the new contract, they're actually being classified as employees. So in some cases, when trainee funds are issued as participant support funds, 
there's a very explicit distinction between trainees and employees and the uniform guidance. So I've been wondering if that is a cause for concern and if anyone's looking into that. Bill, um, I actually just got an email for, uh, I think with the same kind of question yesterday or the day before we, we, I can't, I need to say we're looking into it right now to try and figure out how exactly this is going to work. I don't know that it was all mapped out yet. Um, so, um, I, I need, yeah. How's that for, I need to get back to you to everybody in, in the next, you know, week or two. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. There was a question I see, okay, uh, in the chat, I, I see that Denise has responded to it regarding the meetings, monthly meetings of COI, and Denise has already responded. Anything else from anybody? I just wanna let folks know about some upcoming training opportunities offered by the Sponsor Programs Office. So tomorrow we have a class, I mentioned it last, uh, month at the forum. It's a research administration workshop. I just put it in the chat. It's called preparing a cost proposal budget. So it's tomorrow from nine to 11. If you're interested in joining that, write SPO training at ucdavis.edu and I'll send you the Zoom access link. And then uh, additionally, we have some instructor led classes coming up in the next month. And these two classes, proposal preparation and submission, and understanding the awards process. They're both part of the research administration certificate series. And the first is offered on August 10th, the second on August 24th. Uh, these classes are also available by eCourse, but this is an opportunity to take the class with an instructor leading it. They're both offered via Zoom. And if anyone has any questions, you can reach out to me directly at peking at ucdavis.edu if, if you want. That's all, thanks. Thank you, Perry. Well, last call for questions. Otherwise, we are going to stop. I don't see anything coming in. Well, I guess we'll meet next time in August. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day.